everybody. I'm at the Grand Ballroom of Shangri-La at the Fort, and I'm here for a Citibank Mid-Year Investment Outlook. Volatility. We think that volatility is here to stay, at least in the foreseeable future. 
especially when macro issues are present, like the green tensions and rising interest rates headlined by the Federal Reserve. With that, I think that the way to address portfolio volatility is by being diversified. And one way of achieving diversification is by getting into multi-asset strategies. And I'm not only saying balanced strategies like stocks and bonds, but there are clearly products out there that are multi-asset in nature, meaning 10 types of products apart from the usual stocks, bonds, and cash. The second point is benefit from growth. Regardless of the volatility that we've seen, growth continues, especially in emerging markets, especially in Asia. And for that, investors must have exposure to emerging markets in Asia. Third is seek, seek, seek shelter with income. In the previous briefing, we warned investors about rising interest rates. Well, today, interest rates have already risen. Have they peaked? Probably not. But yields right now are quite attractive compared to what they were 6, 12 months ago. And they're attractive up to a point that they're trying to attract even those who are the most conservative investors. So please have this conversation with the relationship manager to explore income options that are available. And lastly, the return of this dollar weakness. In times of risk aversion, the dollar strengthens. And when risk aversion declines and abates, we expect the dollar to weak and start to weaken again as people regain their senses and, say, and move on to riskier assets. So we think that when the dollar starts to weaken, the first beneficiary would be European assets, which are denominated in euros. So these are the investment themes of City for Investors for the rest of the year. So if you may ask, is there a magical formula? Is there a all to test volatility in your portfolio? I'd like to end this segment before I call on our first speaker with this particular photograph. When asked if there's a magic ring for investors, the wise wizard said, no, just buy your dreams. So with that, um, I'd like to call on our first guest for tonight. He's the head of equities of ATR Manage Asset Management. We'll talk about the Philippine economy and the outlook for Philippine equities. Please welcome Mr. Julian Jun Tarabago Jr. Uh, Kelvin, uh, what's Allianz's forecast on global growth and what supports this view? Yeah, right. So, thanks, Ron. I think you know the question comes very appropriate. Uh, not only have we just concluded the first half of 2018, we've also concluded the World Cup, so it's a good time to start thinking straight and look at the investments for the rest of the year, right? And uh, I thought that it would be very appropriate to actually start the presentation using this slide because the, the question people tend to ask is that hey so where are we now is it too late to invest are we in a bubblish territory so i think you know this slide tends to actually address some of uh, all of everybody's uh, concern so i think this slide aims to talk about where we are now so if you look at the red line uh, this is the current bull market that we are in right and for, for some of you who are wondering at what stage of the cycle are we we are right now in the ninth year, right? Ninth year. Nine of, years. Yes, nine years of bull rally, right? And uh, the question is, is, is it time to start becoming a bear market? Um, so I think the, the key takeaway that I really want to highlight here today here is that a bull market will never ever die of old age, right? It will not just simply because of valuation is too high, or oh, let's start having a correction, or let's start entering a recession. A bull market itself will only sizzle when fundamentals start to change. And in today's time and date, the good news is that, and using you know, Ramon's previous slide on the 16-point checklist on, on the global outlook, currently fundamentals is still in favor of the bull rally to continue and substantiating why a bull market will never die of old age. It has to die because there is something something fundamentally wrong about it, right? And having said that, if you look at this chart, you also notice that despite the fact that we are on the ninth year of a bull rally, it is not the longest, <laughs> right? If you look at the black line, uh, the black line is actually the longest bull rally. Uh, that was the year of 1982 to 1989. 
Um, that was just before the, uh, sorry, not 1982. It was uh, the September 1990 to the March 2000. It was just before the dot com uh, bust. And the reason why it bust is because of the dot com. <laughs> so there must be a reason why the bull rally will eventually start to sizzle down. So I think that hope that uh, helped to set the stage on where are we now. And to actually ask on why do we think that the fundamentals are still supporting, maybe the next chart will actually illustrate uh, certain points. So on the left hand side, it talks about the world PMI, which is the Purchaser, uh, Purchasing Managers Index. Every time when this line is above 50, it tells us that you know, the global you know, economy is expanding. And every time when the line is below 50, it means that the global economy is contracting. The good news is that we have been uh, trading above the number 50 for a good period of time now. Uh, if you look at the past, you know, um, eight, nine years, you know, the global economy is indeed expanding, right? The good news here is that if you look at the right-hand diagram, uh, this global recovery is synchronized, right, between developed world, which is represented by DM, and also the emerging markets, which is represented by EM. So we were looking at, you know, a consolidated, you know, a synchronized global recovery that's actually keeping this bull rally intact. Um, you did mention that uh, number one, we've been in this uh, bull market for a long time. The uh, economic indicators are still looking up. But what about corporate earnings? Um, how do they do? They look like now uh, across the world. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, one thing that we really must you know educate investors is that uh, GDP has no bearings to earnings growth. <laughs> Having a high GDP does not mean that you definitely have a stellar stock market performance. Likewise, having a lower GDP, it does not mean that your earnings is going to be weaker, right? So looking at this chart, I think the key uh, takeaway, once again, for all investors is that when I buy into a stock market, and what June has mentioned, um, it is all about this keyword called earnings. If a company is not making earnings top line, bottom line, basically it doesn't matter whether GDP is growing up down upwards or downwards right so hence the result looking at this chart it tells you the earnings revision momentum over the last 10 years right and uh, if you look at the diagram you also notice that there's a few colored lines so let me run, run through very quickly the blue line talks about S&P 500 it represents the US the orange line talks about topics which is Japan and then we have Europe hovering below uh, represented in the light blue so what you notice is that this ratio uh, of earnings revision tells you that every time when there's more earnings upgrade and compared to earnings downgrade, the ratio will be above one. Every time when earnings upgrade is lesser than earnings downgrade, the ratio will be less than one, right? So very clearly you notice is that one of the key markets, S&P 500, which is US, they've actually been having a very nice ratio that is exceeding one for a substantial period of time. And in the recent consolidation, in the last three, six months, this ratio has come down to about 1.5, right? The key takeaway once again here is that, yes, market is right now in a consolidation phase, but we are still seeing more upgrade in terms of earnings than compared to downgrade, which is key. And uh, despite the fact that key markets like US have actually been doing really well, Europe, on the other hand, hasn't had benefited in a very big fashion. And one of the key, you know, forward-looking aspect is that because the euro has been weakening, it, did, it can actually send the earnings probability of the companies within the eurozone to start to do better. So that line that has actually been trending sub one, right, from euro, from uh, emerging markets, and eventually start to go higher. So overall, if you look at the, the, the global economic landscape across developed markets, would you say that the US is still the fastest growing? And what about the other major markets? Yeah, I think in a, in a nutshell, I think we do believe that US will continue to lead global recovery, global growth, not only representing in the developed nation, but as a global representation, right? US tends to be the global locomotive engine. So we are still, you know, uh, bullish on how the outlook for US is. And of course, on the flip side of the EM markets, you know, China, uh, in terms of the GDP growth, is still expected to be uh, something that is consistent uh, at about uh, 6.5 to 6.7%. 
Um, let's move on to the second question, uh, Kelvin. And uh, earlier in my presentation, we talked about the trade war, the potential trade war. So I guess my question is, in a nutshell, what's the impact of a potential U.S.-China trade war on all of us? Okay, I think this is once again another million dollar question. <laughs> Uh, I do not have a crystal ball, but I think you know trade war in general is unhealthy uh, for the global economy. And I think to to achieve address some of the questions here is that maybe we can start off by looking at the cartoon. So we can look at the you know King Kong represented by the U.S. and another you know uh, Godzilla represented by China. I think these are the two bigger markets, the biggest markets in the global economy is actually right now fighting. Right. And uh, to give you some uh, insights, so as of the 6th of July, I think uh, at 12 p.m. Singapore time, which is the same as Philippine time, uh, U.S. have actually officially declared 34 billion uh, dollars of trade tariffs right, to be imposed onto China. And of course, after that imposition of the trade tariffs from the U.S., China has also followed suit. Right. So this is officiated this trade war, it used to be called trade disputes, but right now it's trade, trade war. And that, was, that happened on the 6th of July. And just when we thought that the test more or less settled and the stock market started to recover, on the 10th of July, another $200 billion worth of trade war, uh, or trade, trade imposition from the US, has actually been coming out from the uh, Trump administration. So what we are actually trying to say here is that, you know, we really want to look at a dispute to be actually, you know, a, a piece with further, you know, talks, meetings to actually alleviate such situation. Um, because if you look at the next, you know, information chart in front of you, from the middle to the right, what you will actually notice is that a trade war is actually hard to be um, settled for the fact that US has a deficit with China. And if you look at that deficit uh, column, um, it is simply for the fact that because the US is more affluent, it clearly imports more consumer goods from China, right? And you cannot expect China to import the same amount of goods from the US for the fact that US goods are not as cheap and the population in China is not as affluent, right? So to, to put the trigger point to China and say that, hey, you have to correlate with my spending with your economy is not something sensible. So until this is actually being, you know, uh, uh, negotiated, set out in a meeting, uh, we do believe that volatility, unfortunately, will still be uh, um, round about in the next couple of months. Okay. And if, if you can look at it, which sectors have been showing the fastest earnings growth and what's driving this earnings growth? Right. So, so once again, thank you for the question. I think the reason why uh, many investors tend to find US to be expensive uh, is for the fact that they were looking at index levels. So looking at S&P 500, looking at NASDAQ, looking at Dow Jones, they all have a common feature, which is that they have all broken through all-time high, and right now at higher high. And hence, as an investor, looking at index level, you may think that, hey, is US too late a game that I should start investing in. Um, so I actually have uh, generated a chart in front of you uh, to actually say that, hey, do not look at index levels as a reason why you as investors should invest or not. You should look at this keyword called, once again, earnings, right? So if you look, look at this chart on the S&P 500, it stretches all the way to 1997, right? Um, I use two years uh, as a good illustration to everybody. So if I can just focus to your attention, in the year of 2000, right, the S&P 500 hit an index high of 1,500. And in the year of 2007, seven years later, S&P 500 hit the same index level of 1,500. But what you actually notice is that despite the fact that the indices are both at 1,005, the PE ratio between these two periods are significantly different. If you look at the year of 2000, S&P 500 was at a PE of 27 times. Whereas in the year of 2007, the PE was at 15 times. So looking at index level tells you absolutely nothing whether is this an entry point or is this an exit point. It just tells you currently what is the market cap of the index. 
simply period, that's it, right? So for us as an investor, it's all about earnings expectation. Currently, US S&P 500, as we speak, is hovering about 2005, 2006 levels. It is an all-time high, but having that correction that's actually been experiencing in the past three to six months, you notice is that the forward earnings for S&P 500 right now has been reduced to about 15 times, right? So you actually can see that, hey, hey if you're looking at an earnings uh, expectation, um, 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 forward-looking perspective, right now S&P 500 looks cheaper than compared to three, six months ago. If you look at the sectors in the US stock market, uh, you can clearly see what's driving earnings. So uh, your comments here. Okay. So I think, you know, one, one um, um, good news is that despite the fact that earnings growth in the U.S. has been hitting all-time high, market has actually not priced in it substantially in the last three to six months. So if you run through the diagram on the left-hand side, it talks about a sector ranking on a year-on-year -year earnings growth perspective on S&P 500. And you'll notice that the top two sectorial growth with the highest earnings was realized by energy and material sector. Uh, the reason why they are actually experienced such high earnings growth is because one year ago, they were actually the rock bottom sector. <laughs> so one year later, with energy prices recovering, uh, material prices also coming back, that's why they've actually experienced a super, you know, accelerated earnings expectation. Do we expect this to continue in the next quarter, in the subsequent quarter? Clearly no, right? But the good news is that in the quarter one of 2018, US on average have actually experienced a 25% uh, earnings growth on a year on year perspective, and that is great, right? But having said that, you have not seen SP 500 experience a 25% upside in the past quarter. So the good news is that um, this earnings expectation has right now not been priced in into the market now. Uh, as a house, which sector do we like? Uh, we still continue to like IT and financials to lead that consistent growth. We're not looking at the fastest growth, we're looking at the more consistent growth uh, within the US. So in a nutshell, if you look at the US economy, uh, can you really say that growth has been uh, good and that we continue to see it in a good level for the future? And what about the tightness or the, the, the tendency for the economy to reach capacity? Is that something that we should be worried about? Yes, I, yes, once again, bring back the fundamentals. So, if the index levels is to continue, it has to be backed by, firstly, earnings, and secondly, it would be great if the economy is doing well. So, the US right now is in a sweet spot for the fact that it has both. It has got earnings, and it's got fundamentals. And very clearly, we do expect that this year, US economy is still expected to grow at about a GDP rate of about 2.8 to 2.9. So, it tells you that as a developed world, uh, US is still the fastest growing DM markets. On the right hand side, if you look at the uh, labor market, uh, we are also experiencing good labor type market. Right now, I think it's rock bottom. Unemployment rate has never been so low before. And this is also telling us that going forward, we do also expect rich growth to start to come back in a bigger fashion. Because with a very, very tight labor market, there's only one direction in terms of retaining your assets, which is the labor. So we do see that phenomenon to also start to pan out in six to nine months down the road. Okay, enough about equities. Let's move on to the other asset class uh, on interest rates. So what's Allianz's view on US interest rates? Where is it headed? And if it's rising, up to where should we expect it to go up? Right. So I think that this uh, is a great question. And coincidentally, you know, last night, Jerome Powell, you know, um, of the Federal Reserve has also started to come publicly to say that, hey, the outlook for US in terms of economy, GDP looks great. Um, the case to continuously hike rates is intact. Uh, having said that, it does not mean that if the market start, starts to turn or the US economy starts to also go nosedive, this message will continue. I believe that Jerome Powell is very fluid and they are trying to be very flexible in terms of their monetary policy. Right now, because of the US statistics and data being in the positive direction, so hiking rates is inevitable to cool the market, right? So as a house, we believe that rate hike cycle will continue. Uh, we do expect, you know, there, um, 
that the next um, 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 year we are expecting to see another three to four times rate hike. So hold, uh, with the Fed fund rates hovering about 2.75 to 3 percent, it's a very likely outcome. All right. My my last question for you, Kelvin, tonight. Uh, overall, given the global growth forecast, rising trade tensions, rising interest rates, where should clients? Um, yeah, as my final slide of the day, I think, you know, and this is also my favorite slide, I think, you know, um, investors always ask a very simple question. Should I take risks or should I not take risks? <laughs> right, so it's as simple as that, right? And um, we have actually done up a very clear-cut illustration um, in front of you. So this diagram in front of you is split into the top half and the bottom half. The top half talks about the US 10-year treasury in terms of its actual yield. Right? The bottom half uh, is split by the asset class performance. Uh, in green, this is what we categorize as risk assets. In red, is what we classify as safe assets. Right? So let me just take you through the top diagram first, which is the US 10-year treasury. Uh, what you'll notice is that over the past five years, you notice that the 10 years treasuries has been hovering about its rock bottom of about 1.3 to current high of about 2.8, 2.9. It has broken through to 3 for a while, but right now it's back down about 2.84. So what the diagram at the, at the top tells you is that every time when the US Treasury yields spikes up by more than 50 basis points, which is 0.5%, we shade it in grey for you. Right? So in the past five years, there were actually five occasions where the US 10-year treasuries spike up by more than 50 basis points. Right? I won't go into every single scenario, but maybe let's look at the latest one, which is the current market environment. Right? So the, the most recent period when the US 10-year treasury spiked up by more than 50 basis points was observed last year, September 7th, 2017. The, the yield was at 2.05. Right? It spiked up all the way to about 2.96 in April this year. Right? So it was more than 50 basis points. Right? So in this kind of rate hiking environment when treasury yields start to spike, the question investors tend to ask, should I buy risk assets or should I buy safe assets? And very nicely, we've actually pocketed for you. So in green, safe uh, um, risk assets, you'll notice that during a rate hike environment, U.S. equities, U.S. corporate bonds, and U.S. high yields tend to be in a better position. They have actually made positive return whenever the yields start to spike up. But despite the fact that, hey, safe assets sound safe to me, unfortunately, you have lost money, right? So I think one, one example I really want to point out here is this classic example uh, called U.S. treasuries. U.S. Treasury sounds absolutely safe, right? Uh, because if you do believe that the, the U.S. government will not go bust on you, uh, buying U.S. Treasury is a, is a sure thing, right? But being safe it does not mean that you will not materialize mark-to-market losses, right? So one classic example, in the year of 2007, September, if you bought a 10-year U.S. Treasury, your yield would be 2.05%. What does 2.05 mean? It means that if I were to buy at 2.05 for the next 10 years, every year I should get 2.05 and upon maturity, I get my 100% back and my return is 2.05. But unfortunately, if you bought it in April 2008, this year, your yield would have been 30% higher at 2.96. And as long as the US government don't boom boom bust and it is the same bond, right, you will get 30% higher than what you've actually bought six months ago. So as an investor, if you were to sell that bond, if you look at the last row below, you have realized a loss of negative 5.1. Is this a safe asset? Definitely. If you were to hold it all the way to maturity for the next 10 years, right? But in the interim, if you are not an investor that want to hold it for the next 10 years, then it is time to think, should I be buying safe assets or should I buy risk assets? Right, so um, final words, Kelvin, uh, on essentially what's Allianz's view of the markets and how should clients position themselves? 
Okay, yeah, I think my, my key four quick takeaways that uh, based on the slides I've actually gone through would be that, you know, despite the fact that we are in the ninth year of a bull rally, fundamentals earning is still backing this bull rally to continue. Point number two, we still think that, you know, geopolitical tensions and trade tariffs will increase the market volatility, so don't just sit uh, in your car without putting on a seatbelt. Third point, uh, we still believe that global growth Earnings fundamentals still look sound. Uh, there is actually no indication to tell us that we are going to meet up with a bear market in the very, very near future. And lastly, we still prefer a moderate overweight in equities than compared to fixed income. So embrace yourself with a more bumpy right, but it does not mean that you do not take risks. All right, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kelvin Lam. Emerging markets in Asia Pacific stock markets have a history of volatility. Historically, how bad can it get? And what has been the historical average performance of these markets? Okay, let's just address things head on, volatility. So most people, when they talk about investing in Asia Pacific, investing in emerging markets, they treat that as somewhat of a bad word. Now, volatility doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. So if you're able to take advantage of volatility, it's a good thing. Certain sectors do well, certain sectors do bad, so you overweight the good, underweight the bad. If you're able to, go long or short. Now, if I can pick up not the first slide, what I wanted to show, so one of the questions in there was how bad can a breeding get? What do clients do? How can you expect to sort of see Asian assets perform in this scenario? So this graph here shows you all the stocks in the Asia Pacific Universe in MSCI Index. And what we've done is we plotted on all those little red dots. So this goes back 30 years, right? So 70% of you are long-term investors, so this should resonate with 70% of the audience. What we've done is on every single one of those years, we've marked the worst time in the year. So the maximum that Asian stocks corrected within one single year. Whether or not the stock market closes positive or closes negative, there will always be volatility. Now, what we wanted to show in this particular case was in the past 30 years, 19 of those years, equity markets, even though experience, let's say an average drop of 20% within a year, have managed to close out positive. Right. Just to pick a couple of examples, if you look at 2000, was that 2006, the stock market dropped 18% at its worst. So if you panic and you sold at the bottom, you would have lost 16%. Sorry, 18%. If you held it just until December, you would have made close to 30%. And that's just buying the index. Obviously, you can definitely add value, but when I mentioned earlier, my overweighting and underweighting sectors that you like and don't like. Now, if we go to the next one, I want to obviously share a little bit as to sort of why 2017 was a bit of a strange year. Now, we talked about earnings quite a lot tonight, and unfortunately, I will continue to talk about earnings in my segment. But I wanted to break down a little bit as to what components you should be looking at when you're thinking about investing in equities. Now obviously earnings growth in the purple is where we focus quite a lot of time. Because if I show you the same graph in Asia Pacific and I pull that back to just two to three years, what you can see is within the first six odd months, that gray bar, that change in valuations, whether or not stocks get re-rated up or re-rated down, that drives near-term performance. But what really drives long-term performance is earnings. Because you're ultimately paying for what the company can deliver to you as a shareholder. Good news is 2017 was a year where you had, if you look at far, the far left hand side of that chart, that's emerging markets aggregated. That did about close to 40% last year, so emerging markets did pretty well. Mainly driven by purple, the earnings growth, because obviously emerging markets have had a couple, tough couple of years ahead of that, and once earnings growth recovered, that delivered in earnings, in obviously stock market performance. But if we can go back one slide, 2017 was a bit of an abnormal year. So if you look at the performance of the stock market over there, 38%. But interestingly, that red dot, the inter-year decline, so the maximum drawdown within the year, 2017 was the lowest drawdown in the past 30 years. So it's the closest you will get to a free lunch in investing in stock markets. So 2017 was in a normal year. 2017 was completely abnormal. All right, so the average is 20% losses within the year at the bottom. All right, that was minus 4%. Now, 2017 
we don't expect that will happen this year. So a lot of investors are saying to us now, the stock, the stock market is so volatile. Not really. We're just moving back to a normal period of volatility. Because we've been in this artificially low volatility environment for quite some time. And unfortunately, some investors have gotten used to it. Now, if we look at the performance of the stock market this year, what's happened? <clears throat> right, 27 to 2018 has been a bit, bit of a tough year. I mean, June covered it earlier. There has been, unfortunately, a risk-off sentiment with obviously a lot of the trade disputes going on, a lot of sort of negative news in the world right now. So there has been, unfortunately, an indiscriminate sell-off in emerging market assets. So Philippines was not the only country. It happened across the board. But if you look at the drivers of this underperformance, earnings growth on the main part has still been positive. And that's the key. If earnings growth turns sour, which they have been in the past previous years, then you wouldn't want to hold the stock if it's going to actually lose you money. But earnings for emerging markets and Asian companies continue to deliver strong growth, and we expect this sell-off to be essentially a short-term healthy correction. So for investors who have not had exposure, this is pretty much the moment and window you've been waiting for. Okay, so now we've determined that Asia, emerging markets, are volatile and that could be a good or bad thing. Now, what, what's the case, what's the solid case for Asian equities? And are there any concepts or principles that investors can, can, can rely on in terms of determining the case for Asian markets? I think it's important to understand where the drivers of your performance is coming from. Right? So there were four categories just right now which we talked about. Earnings is obviously the most important. Dividends is something that can boost your returns. Currency is something you have to be aware of because unfortunately emerging market currencies can be volatile and in a year they can wipe your entire returns. And finally changing in valuations. Are you paying more or less and how, value, and how the stocks re rate you? Now let's look at the first one. Let's zoom in a little bit closer at home and look at Asia Pacific. Right. On the graph on the left hand side that essentially shows you the earnings by all the various sectors in Asia Pacific stock. And if you notice, on a broad trend basis, this is trending upwards. Right? Up until, I would say, the end, towards the mid to the end of 2016, Asian earnings have actually been in a bit of a recession. Right? Exports were doing bad, people didn't like to buy stuff, growth was still trying to consolidate itself. But I would say, at the midpoint of 2016 onwards, we had seen a resurgence in our exports, dollars started to correct, and our earnings finally picked up. 2017 was driven primarily by tech, that really sharply appreciating purple line there. But we would argue that the recovery this year will be much more broad based across financials, across healthcare, telecoms, materials, all of these various sectors. And I would say the second point you look at obviously is valuations. So on the next one, you'll see on a valuations perspective, Asia Pacific is actually relatively decently valued. What we've done here is we've just showcased the valuations across the sort of three major markets and looked at it from a long-term average perspective. On the far right there, you see Asia Pacific trading at below long-term averages, and this is before the recent sort of sell-off, more recent times in June. So you're actually picking up Asia Pacific and emerging markets at a deeper valuation, at a cheaper valuation. At the same time, its earnings is still picking up and growing. And I'll say that final component is on the dividends. So Asia Pacific and the emerging markets is quite an interesting place for dividends. So for those of you who are income investors or investors who like periodic cash flow into your account or essentially like the more stable nature of dividend investing, what we've done here is we've taken essentially global stocks of everything in the world and we ranked those down by obviously the ones who pay dividends. And then we ranked it by the level of dividends that they pay out for over 1% to over 7%. Now, we cut it off in the middle, and what you can see there is something rather interesting, whereby Asia Pacific is quite fertile. There's a rather big universe for you to pick from, for stocks that can deliver you over 4% dividend. Now, obviously, that's a little bit different in Japan, where that's eight stocks to choose from. Now, going back to those drivers of stock performance, you have earnings, Valuations are attractive. You have opportunities to pick stocks that can deliver you a cushion of 
dividends on top of your overall sort of share price. And we expect currency, we talked about earlier, the US dollar, we believe, should actually start moderating towards the second half of this year. So the stars are right. All right. Uh, earlier, Kelvin talked about the path of interest rates in the US. And, and pretty much, we, we, all, we all believe, we all agree, that uh, the, the Federal Reserve uh, determines the general path uh, for the rest of the world. So I guess my next question is, how has equities in general, in Asia Pacific equities to be more specific, have performed during periods of rising interest rates? And if you can also talk about the similar performance during that period of fixed income strategies. Yeah, so if we go to the next one. So interestingly enough, so we expect the Fed to hike a total of four times this year. Next year, three to four times. So we're still on that path. We're not going anywhere anytime soon. Now, Kelvin touched a little bit on the sort of fixed income side. Obviously, you have to be quite selective where you buy bonds in an interest rate rising environment. Typically, bond yields go up, prices go down. You actually mark to market lose money, right? So we've done a little bit of an interesting little split here where we looked at what happens from an asset class perspective when interest rates rise? Green is stocks, gray is bonds. What you'll notice is that when interest rates start rising, you have to be a bit more selective in the bonds that you buy. If you generally just buy government bonds, this will actually lose you money as the, share, as the price of these bonds go down. So you have to start buying bonds and have a higher correlation or relationship to stocks, things like high yield, for example whereby they actually have a relatively strong correlation to companies because essentially, if the company can service their debt, you actually make your money. And how do they service their debt? They perform, they make money, and et cetera, et cetera. But interestingly, if you look at the top of this chart, you see interest rates rise, you would think dollar was strengthened, that's bad for emerging markets, bad for Asia, and these things tend to lose money. But going, this is going back to 1994, now, Emerging markets, high dividend, Asia Pacific, high dividend, tend to perform better. And there's a reason for that. On the right hand side, we broke down all these various indices, so the world and emerging markets in Asia Pacific. And you'll notice one main difference. Here in Asia and emerging markets in general, we have a much higher proportion of financials. You look at the world at about 15%, here is about one third of our index is in financials. And why is this important? Interest rates are rising, which means, first of all, the economy must be doing well for interest rates to rise. Banks tend to perform better when there's more lending, more, kind of more confidence, more spending, etc. Secondly, as interest rates rise, banks can lend you at a higher interest rates. Borrow, actually, obviously, higher interest rates. Well, but like, obviously, the margin that they make from a banking perspective becomes greater, therefore delivering higher earnings, banks make more money, their share price do better. So by having more financials in our indices, we actually benefit. So interest rates rising in Asia, love it, great thing. So we've talked about the case for emerging markets in Asia, we've talked about the case for Asian equities. Um, are there any special sectoral or structural themes in Asian equities that clients uh, right now should uh, be aware of? So if you break down sort of like broad themes we're seeing in Asia Pacific right now, so apart from the individual company fundamentals, apart from the individual sort of earnings, what sort of structural things we're seeing? I would say the first thing, obviously, carrying on my earlier points, we still see financials at the moment as interest rates rise to continue to do better. Right? We see earnings picking up. We see concerns around non-performing loans, et cetera, and shadow banking and China receding. We see that obviously right now, they're delivering very high dividends. You can pick up Chinese banks that give you about 6 to 7% dividend yield. But more importantly, the valuation of the price that you're paying for these is single digit price earnings. That's crazy. Right? These have been bashed for so long. And these are like the big caps, the big four Chinese banks, which will never ever go anywhere. They're state owned. They're state owned. But as long as the Chinese government doesn't go bust, these guys will be fine. Right? These guys are actually delivering you strong earnings the back of obviously consolidation in the Chinese sort of like financial debt, financial markets, they're delivering you high dividend growth at a cheap valuation. 
apart from Chinese banks, we're seeing this actually kind of being quite broad based. We picked DBS and Singapore as an example of what you can see and the relationship between earnings and share price, just to sort of hammer that point home. The sort of second thing we're seeing, and this is something quite intuitive, I think, is sort of the rise and the, the, the sort of the growth in the middle class in Asia Pacific. Now, in many markets, this is obviously being a big structural thing, where obviously the creation and the growth of the middle class has a knock-on impact as to what consumers buy and spend their money on. Our savings rates are picking up, spending, spending patterns are changing. Now, as you move towards that sort of higher sort of income bracket, what we've noticed as a trend is, unfortunately, the need for branded goods. Right? So, from a generic washing machine, you're now buying LG, for example from a sort of like no-name sort of little device or a flip phone, you're now moving into little sort of Samsung little products. Now, this shift up in a sort of value, value curve obviously has a big sort of impact sort of thing. From a portfolio construction perspective, obviously looking at stocks that benefit from this shift in consumer trends is obviously quite important. At the same time, as people have more money to spend, they need more protein. Right? It sounds a little silly to say out loud, but this is a sort of example of a company in China that is the largest sort of market shareholder in sort of pork in China. And obviously you can see that reflected in their earnings and consequently in their share price. And also the last one, which is I would say the most important and the theme that will last the longest out of all these three, is shareholder reform. Now this started off in Japan with the whole Abenomics three arrows a few years back. More recently, that's shifted a little bit, and, and Korea has started to implement these. And more recently, again, in China, where they have actually started to implement these, whereby the government, and this is happening from the top down, so it's obviously on a policy-related, uh, policy-driven perspective, whereby regulators in all these various countries are trying to crack down on companies who are essentially making lots of money, holding cash, and not giving that back to shareholders. In the form of dividends. In the form of dividends, in the form of buybacks. Right? So they're just keep, literally keeping cash, not reinvesting that back in the company in order to generate a higher share price or whatever it is. Now, to the, to, to the point where we're seeing finally dividends happening in Japan, but you saw in that earlier number, it's a bit slow. They're not actually growing at that fast pace yet. But in Korea, that's significantly changed. If you look at that graph on the right-hand side, Dividend share, dividend payout, and share buybacks have tremendously growing. At the same time, two years ago, China started embarking on this policy of looking at companies where they essentially need to start paying back, especially sort of government-owned companies. And the regulator themselves came out to say that if you, if you, as a Chinese company, really are making money, pay that back to your, to your shareholder. Demonstrate that you actually have that money to be paying out. So this is something that's structural, this is something that's going to be with us for many, many, many years. Right? And this is something I, I believe could change, change the landscape of the way we invest in Asia. Okay, my, my final question, uh, Anis, uh, tonight, for Ian in Asia, which pretty much uh, wraps things up so far in our discussion, is overall, what are the compelling arguments for EM in Asia Pacific, and how should clients invest in these markets? Yeah, look, at, at the end of the day, the reason why you buy emerging markets, the reason why you buy buying Asia is you're buying the growth, or you're buying a higher level of growth. Right. So on that chart there, we show developed markets in the purple line and emerging market growth in the blue line. And that's essentially what you should be thinking about. The difference between these two is ultimately the premium that you're paying for and what you should be expecting in terms of higher returns from emerging markets over developed markets. So argument number one is why you're buying these guys is you're buying them because they're growing faster. The second reason is obviously valuations. We're trading at a very, very cheap discount right now compared to long-term averages. And obviously we're seeing flows from large institutional clients coming back into emerging markets. And these guys obviously have a much more sort of like sophisticated palette when it comes to risk on, risk off modes. So we're seeing trends from large institutional investors diving right back into emerging markets as they're correcting. We believe this could rotate very, very quickly once trade concerns start sort of like dematerializing. And we're seeing sort of like pullback talks from last night as well already. And more importantly, once the US dollar starts to normalize again and going as on its multi-year decline, this is a big boost for emerging markets. 
And finally, I think the way clients should really approach this, and I've, talked, I've touched on this a couple times tonight already, is thinking about investing in Asia, not just on growth. People think about Asia many times, and they think about, okay, so I go for the highest octane thing, make the most money, and get out. But really, we touched on the fact that Asia has an attractive level of yield. Now that's important because, first of all, that augments your overall total return. But secondly, because you have that yield, when, when stocks correct or when there's, there's more volatility in the market, that, that sort of yield that, that buffs up your total return also adds a, as a cushion. So by looking at Asia and investing in a dividend or an income perspective, you're actually getting a less volatile, I mean, so you see what I'm doing, going back full circle, right? A less volatile approach to investing in Asia is through this dividend, right? And the second thing I think is something that we don't talk about much at all really in our industry is the compounding effect of investing in income. And what this basically means is that for every bit of money you get back as a dividend or an income holder, Reinvesting that back into these existing investment investments means you can actually grow your assets exponentially. So an example of this is if we took $100 and invested back way back in 1970, and this is just an exaggerated example just to sort of really make the point, and invested in the global stock market. So this is global stocks, and if this was Asia, you should expect higher returns. And if we invested $100 back in 1970, and just held the index from then to now, you would have made $2,000. So 2,000% over almost 50 years. Okay. Now, if you were to invest with a dividend approach, that number jumps up to 2,900. 50% more. Just on a dividend basis. Remember I talked about how that adds as a cushion, both on the total return and on managing volatility. But that assumes I get the dividend and I spend it right away. Now, what happens then if, if I get that dividend, but instead of spending it, I put it right back in cash, put it in my fixed deposit, put it in my whatever cash equivalent product that I have right now. From 2009, that number jumps up to 5,009. That's compounding. So whatever you get in terms of yield, you're putting that back to work in some instrument that continues to generate a yield, and that compounds over time. But I think what's more powerful is if you get a strategy that pays out an income, and you take that income, reinvest that back into that same strategy, that number from initially just 2,000 from $100 becomes 8,500. That's compound. And I think that's an interesting thing that we can talk about. This is not just Asia, this is across every asset class. All right, thank you very much. Uh, a round of applause, please, for Mr. Anise. Okay. Um, this is the third day of our road show here in uh, BGC for our Makati clients. Yesterday we were at the uh, Etsa Shangri-La and uh, on Monday we were uh, at uh, Cebu, in Cebu. And I heard that uh, you visited the new airport in Cebu and it's been in the news lately on, on how world class it is. So if you can share with the audience here what you've seen there when you visited. Yes, um, since we were in Cebu anyway, it took uh, the opportunity to to visit one of the premier, I think, infrastructure projects. Uh, as you well know, a big theme for the Philippines, uh, Philippine economic uh, growth story is infrastructure and made it a point to visit the, the Cebu Mactan International Airport and it was beautiful. Uh, this is the, the MCIA Terminal 2 wherein they had beautiful wooden arcs simulating a resort-like uh, hotel and uh, very efficient uh, operations. Uh, I think they were timing the the, the, the the maximum weight any tourist or passenger would have in the immigration aisles, uh, even during super peak uh, hours. Uh, FYI, super peak for ho for hotels is 9 a.m. to to 2. Ah, sorry, 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. So if you want to get a glimpse of. Uh, an airport's maximum potential is during those times. Or if you want to avoid uh, maximum traffic in the hotels, you try and uh, not get into the hotel or try not to fly uh, not between the, uh, 9 p.m. And, and 2 o'clock a.m., maybe 2 o'clock a.m. What's that's the that's maximum capacity of the Cebu airport? If I remember correctly, it's about uh, a little over 10 million. Passengers a year? Yes, of which 
uh, yes, 10 million passengers per year, of which 4.5 is international, and uh, the bulk is, is still largely domestic. domestic. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, let's move on to the, uh, the main uh, topics for our program. Uh, we we'll talk about the Philippine uh, markets. Let me, move, let me move to our first question here. By the way, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the questions here uh, were gathered from your relationship managers because we asked them, what are the client's questions to you? So we tried to answer them tonight. Right? First question, why the volatility in Philippine financial markets like the stock market, higher bond yields, and a much weaker peso? Are there still positives to compensate the seemingly more numerous negatives? Um, we'll start off with a question on volatility. Uh, as you well know, uh, I think it was Rene uh, earlier pointed out, quite an eventual first half of the year. The first half of 2018, the Philippine stock market is down 16% uh, in, in peso terms and then even larger 21%. In, in dollar terms. So uh, this is true to both external and internal or domestic related uh, reasons. On the external front, you have rising U.S. bond yields, rising dollar, uh, and the specter of uh, a U.S.-China trade war, uh, which have triggered a classic move out of risk assets. And in this particular case, uh, ladies and gentlemen, emerging market equities and this pressure on this downward, the selling pressure on, on EM equities has exerted its own um, formidable pressures on the local stock market. Hence, our stocks are, are, are down uh, in a meaningful way in the first half of the year. Uh, but even then, maybe even before this EM selling, EM equity selling, uh, the, the Philippine stock market was already weak on the back of domestic-related concerns such as the uh, rising inflation numbers, the uh, what is perceived to be monetary policy uncertainty, um, and thirdly, the uh, weak currency. The, if, if I may uh, point out, the first two domestic related risks, uh, rising inflation and monetary policy uncertainty, have the capability of actually dissipating in the second half of the year. Why is that? Um, for inflation, rice supply is coming in, starting to come in, rice imports. Um, and even with a prospective wage increase in August, is it August or July? Uh, August Maybe 9, August. August 9, yeah. August 9. We still do not, we do not in any way, shape, or form uh, see a, a scenario wherein, in, uh, a, scenario, a runaway inflation scenario. Um, if you look at, if you have, if you get a chance to, look, to, to go get on the internet, you will see that the Philippines is the fourth worst performing stock market in the world, not in Asia, in the world. Worst only compared to the likes of Venezuela, which uh, is, is in crisis politically uh, uh, and, and economically, Argentina and Turkey. And these are economies, markets besieged by unprecedented political and economic instability. So, so we're, we're kind of mentioned in the same page. So it, it, it begs the question, I guess it segues into your, the, the second part of the question, which is, uh, are there, uh, is there a silver lining? Are there positives that seem to, if I remember correctly, outweigh uh, what seems to be numerous negatives uh, that are concerns on the stock market? And I think to, to answer that directly, it all boils down to, growth. Uh, is the Philippine growth story intact? And I think if you look, well, we're believers that the Philippine economy, I think you mentioned it earlier also, will be growing by 6.8%. We agree uh, that the Philippine economy is capable of growing by at least 6.8% over the next few years. And this is driven by an increase in capital formation, uh, foreign direct investments as the government uh, goes deeper into uh, what we think is quite an ambitious $160 billion, that's almost 8 trillion, eight, that's over 7 trillion pesos, uh, peso infrastructure spending program. And this will have meaningful effects or trickle down effects on consumption, stimulating consumption, stimulating, in providing, creating jobs, stimulating consumption. Um, 
stimulating bank lending, um, stimulating, the, stimulating the general uh, well, general economic activity in, in our view. And, and this growth of 6.8 percent, yes, it's there. Uh, at least 6.8 percent will 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 be will go alongside what we think is already healthy growth in consumption in the Philippines. Are there, and, are there any other uh, good stories aside from the growth picture? Are there any other parts of the Philippine economic engine fighting well? Uh, so, so you're growing at 6.8 percent at least, and this is supported by financial flexibility, financial health. What do I mean? It's supported by low debt to GDP uh, numbers for the Philippine economy. It's supported by a healthy banking system with very low, uh, non-performing non loan or NBL risk. So there's a growth story and it's supported by a healthy economic and, and balanced economy. And I guess to answer the question is, yes, there's, there's, there's a silver lining First stop is the economy. The fundamental growth story for the Philippines is intact. Right. Was able to answer your yes. Valuations of Philippine entities <coughs> and corporate earnings growth. Do the fundamentals justify the beating that the markets have received uh, so far? And you mentioned the market being down 17, 16 percent uh, year to date, and perhaps even more on a dollar basis. Yeah. Um, Thank you for the question. Good question. So, so we're framing. Fun, I mean, a lot of people say the, Philipp the fundamentals for the Philippines is are, are are intact, and I like the fact that you asked a, you, you asked a question that frames defines what fundamentals really mean. So, so here we're framing fundamentals in terms of uh, the health of earnings, the sustainability of earnings growth, and valuations. And I guess you put that alongside. Uh, the health of the economy and the growth of the economy. So, for in the case of Philippine corporates, uh, if we take the first quarter core income growth or earnings report of listed companies as an example, we'll see that first quarter core income growth, core meaning take out extraordinary gains or losses, sustainable earnings growth, earnings in the natural course of doing business. Core income growth for the first quarter was plus 9.5%. Now, it's not spectacular, it's not something to call, to, to write home, to, home to, 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 to celebrate, but it's not bad at all. 9.5% is actually at the high, high end, high end range of the range of income growth the Philippines has had over the last few years. So it's actually at the high side. What is more, and, and this was led by uh, property companies with very high earnings visibility. This was led by conglomerates, your Yala Corp, uh, SM, and this was led by, guess who? Telecommunications companies. Companies yeah. that are typically growing by 1 to 5 percent. In this case, grew 23 percent in the first quarter of the year. So, just quickly, where did the earnings growth from telecoms come from? Did suddenly more people start texting again? or? I think it was uh, an easing of pr uh, competitive pricing pressures okay. that, that resulted to uh, EBITDA or profit margin uh, expansion. Okay. Okay. So this is a sector which saw EBITDA margins contract to about 38% or even 37%. And I think EBITDA margins in, in the last quarter were higher than 40% or close to 40%. So that was because of margin expansion. Now, what? That aside, what is most fascinating about this, this chart, or what is most fascinating about first quarter earnings numbers reported by Philippine listed companies is that the 9.5% 9, 9 growth, not bad, actually quite decent corporate earnings growth, was reported despite, if you look at the chart on the right hand side, bank earnings only growing by 2%. How did that happen? Banks comprise what? One fifth of the index? Big the universal stock. A big chunk. Despite only 2% growth for banks, the entire universe, or the PSEI, grew by 9.5%. That gives me a lot of encouragement because I believe, after a lot of meetings with the, with the, with the banks uh, and industry experts and doing our own number crunching, that bank earnings will actually improve as we go through. 2018, maybe, maybe not the second quarter, but 3Q and 4Q bank earnings, we think will improve on the back of, number one, um, 
so, uh, accelerating loan growth. Number two, an expansion of profit margins, or in this case, higher interest rates uh, is an environment conducive for net interest margin or profit margin expansion for the banks. Uh, and then lastly, uh, there would be a normalization of provisioning. There was uh, a higher provisioning front-ended in, in the first part of the year. So we think bank earnings may swing from 2% to probably close to 10%, and if that happens, your 9.5% earnings growth in the first quarter could potentially swing to 12 to 14%, given that the banks have a high or a big weight in the index. And that means, and that, that improvement in earnings will be, I think, embraced by, by foreign investors and investors in general. So you've talked about earnings here, but the, the, the flip side of the coin is that <coughs> markets also look at valuations. So where's the Philippine equity market now in terms of valuation? Philippine stocks are now trading at about 15 and a half and a half, 15.5 times. And uh, while that isn't their cheap, it's actually close to the regional average, it's much, much lower. It's actually fallen off the perch of the premium price earnings multiple the Philippine stock market traded at when we were trading at 22 times. I'm sure the 22 times earning, uh, earnings some, a few uh, periods ago, you had someone like me talking to you about, hey, buy the stock market. It's, it's not cheap, but there's a good growth story. And that was actually an accurate statement. It's just that, you know, certain other factors have actually uh, bludgeoned and, and, and uh, weighed down the equities market. Going back to valuations, we're at about 15.5 times uh, 2018 uh, projected earnings, more way below the 22 times uh, peak. But what's more important is if we roll over to next year, if we look at 2019 price earnings multiples, the, the number is actually at about 13.5 to 14. It's below. It's below. And, and that, I mean, in the past, if I talk to a foreign fund manager, and, Two things would come up. Your economy is so strong and your market is expensive. At 13.5 at to 40 times, I don't think you can call the market expensive anymore. Still not dirt cheap, but can't accurately call it expensive. <coughs> Especially if there is a potential for earnings growth to accelerate. Uh, that said, do the fundamentals uh, warrant the, the, the downturn in the market? Uh, the Philippine stock market has, has experienced this year? I think uh, not. The fundamentals, uh, the, the economy is strong, the risks are manageable, earnings are okay, potentially accelerating, and the valuations are not expensive anymore. Actually support a, a Philippine stock market moving up to higher PSEI levels. All right, thank you, Julie. I'm, I'm on to my last question about the Philippines. So here it goes. Given where the BSEI now, and given the current wall of worry that the markets all over have, should clients at this point be buying or selling, and when should they do it? I, have, I, I know it's the most difficult yeah, question tonight so the, far. Yeah. The, the most difficult uh, question is when should they exactly do it? Because yeah. I, unfortunately, I have to apologize. I, I absolutely have no idea when the bottom will be, what day it will be, at what time during the day will the PSEI reach its, uh, its, its, its bottom. But what I do know is that, uh, based on the factors mentioned earlier, and if you look at where the PSEI is now, you, you asked, the first part of the question is, where is the PSEI now? The PSEI is now, the Philippine Composite Index is now at a level at which uh, you can consider foreign selling to have, have been quite excessive. Why do I say that? Net foreign selling for 2018 year to date is about 1.3 billion, 1.29 billion US dollars. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's already exceeded the net foreign buying in full year 2017. So anything that entered in 2017 is gone. And then some. And then some. And then some. Uh, what's even more remarkable, I, I, I think, um, is the fact that net cumulative foreign flows, which is in this chart, has already fallen to 7.5 billion US dollars. For, for those, uh, if, if I may explain, 
uh, net cumulative foreign flows is the le is the cumulative level of net foreign buying in Philippine stocks in, in this chart since year 2000. And this chart basically shows that net cumulative foreign flows in the Philippines is down to $7.5 billion. That's 70% of the peak of $9 billion this year. More importantly, it's extremely close to a very strong support level of net cumulative foreign flows of $7.4 billion. That's the magic number, $7.4 billion. When the, what does that mean? This chart shows, on the right-hand side of the chart, that at 7.4 billion US dollars, there, there is a propensity for the market to either stabilize or rebound in a big way. And what gives me more encouragement looking at this chart is that there is actually a very high correlation between net cumulative flows and the Philippine stock market. It's actually almost like a perfect correlation if you look at the chart. The blue line is the Philippine stock market index, the Philippine Composite Index. The gray area is cumulative net foreign flows. What this simply means is that we're approaching a level at which net foreign selling is usually exhausted. And in this case, very persistent net foreign selling. We think we're close to a level at which it will dry out. And when that dries out, given the strong fundamentals, intact growth story for the Philippines, given corporate earnings, potentially even accelerating, given that valuations are not expensive anymore, and given that the risks mentioned earlier that are weighing down the market are relatively short-term and I think they're quite manageable. Um, we now enter a period at which you, you are actually experiencing, you're, you're witness to probably the, the most attractive risk-return proposition for Philippine stocks in, 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 a, in a few years. Philippine stocks risk return proposition right now for investors, it's probably at its most attractive in the last few years. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, one other uh, significant, uh, I think, factor is the currency. The, the Philippine peso has uh, weighed down also on the weak peso has weighed down on equity returns. Why? Because over the last five years, equity returns are 23%. Uh, if you convert that into dollars, it's 0.05 percent, meaning it's become Philippine equities were less palatable for foreign investors in the Philippines because all the gains were taken out by the currency. Now, with downside in the currency potentially, uh, I, we think very limited. We estimate the downside in the Philippine peso at about two to three percent from current levels. We think investors can really now seriously look at the Philippines and consider the improving fundamentals. And, and be less held hostage by fears or concerns over the depreciating currency. The, so, the, the way the market is now, which is down 17, 16% uh, year to date, so essentially, what is it pricing a certain level or institute? Right. Actually, the market is now pricing in close to 0%, probably around 3 to 3% 3 earnings growth. and, and I mentioned earlier that the, the, the growth in the first quarter was 9%. Could be even higher as the year progresses. But the market, because of those external factors and some domestic uncertainties, the market is pricing in close to 0% earnings growth. And uh, if we put things into proper perspective, if earnings growth is sustainable at 5 to 9%, that would translate to a fair value PSEI level of 10,000. If earnings growth accelerates above 9%, 10% and better, then the PSEI should ultimately reach 11,000. But this is by year 20, by the end of 2019. That, that's what this chart shows. What again? This 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 means that you, and your your upside on Philippine stocks from from current levels is about 35 percent at 10,000 PSE, it could go as high as 48 percent at PSEI 11,000. Against the downside of, uh, the downside could be depicted as the major support which is 6,800 6, and that's a downside of 8 percent from where we are. Worst case probably 6,500. 
if if sentiment really turns negative, and that's a downside of about 12%. So your risk return, going back to my earlier point, your your downside is probably 8 to 12% at worst on PSEI from current levels against an upside supported by fundamentals or earnings growth of about 38, 35 to 48 percent. So 35 to 48 percent potential upside against the downside of about 8 to 12 percent. Okay, finally, you have uh, about real estate. And our, our, our top pick is Ayala Land, which we think has high, alongside other property developers, will have, a, have a, a high earnings visibility, will probably be firing on all cylinders. You have strong residential makeup on the residential side. You have a resurgence, an apparent resurgence of office demand coming from a resurgence in the BPO space, uh, enhanced and amplified by demand for Pogo, the Pogo online gaming segment. Um, and then we, all, we like the banks as well because of higher interest rates, resulting to higher uh, profit margins and sustainable loan growth. And, uh, a potential uh, normalization or lowering of provisioning expenses. All right. There you have it. Thank you very much. Uh, a round of applause, please, for Mr. June Karabag. Thank you very much. Na M is the newest Vietnamese restaurant in the metro and takes Vietnamese cuisine in Manila to the next level within a cozy home setting. It was opened in 2017 by the Saigon Food Corporation, which has had success with Ban Mi and Ban Nam sandwich and coffee concept stalls. Na M translates to my home, and upon entering the SM Aura branch, you will be entranced by the modern Asian feel with traditional porcelain jars and water puppets and warm wooden interiors. To ensure that